attention, please. Thank you. So when the uh, Board of Advisors of the consortium got together and talked about what this workshop should be about, we thought that we should cover uh, both, we should cover business models, business planning, and market cal the uh, marketing calendar development. And the reason for those three is they all fit together to help you plan uh, your, your business. Now, the, how many people, show of hands, how many people know the difference between a business model and a business plan? Okay, about 30%. Well, there is a big difference. And I'm gonna be talking about business models. My friend, Professor Geltz, will talk about approaching business planning and you'll see the difference as we go along here. So I'm gonna to try to cover about 30 or 40 years of experience in about six or eight slides. Um, and I'm not gonna get very deep into this, but rather just give you the highlights of some thoughts for you to consider as you, as you are developing your business. So uh, that's me, the speaker. Uh, thank you to Don for the uh, image. So what's the goal for tonight? It's to help you think a little bit outside the box because a lot of you apply or a lot of you run your business the way you thought businesses should run the way your family members told you or your friends or your maybe even your uh, college professors or high school uh, teachers i want to tell you there are many ways of putting a business model together it's not the it's not just selling something to a single customer. There are other ways of approaching businesses, and that's what we're gonna cover tonight at a very high level. And uh, I always like to start my presentations with the conclusions. So, and usually I say the conclusions and I say, are there any questions? But I think tonight I might have some additional slides to show you as well. Are we recording, by the way? <laughs> okay, uh, we're off the slide a little bit. Okay, anyway, uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, so, the conclusions for tonight. If you're a web or a graphic designer, show of hands, how many people in the room are web or graphic designers? A few, okay. When you start a new project, please request from your client a copy of their business model and their business plan before you start. And if they don't give it to you, tell them you're not going to start unless they give it to you. And the reason for that is you're going to spend tons of time asking all the questions that they should have already answered in that document, which is gonna end up costing them a lot of money and a lot of frustration, and on your part, a lot of time that you probably won't get paid for, because they're gonna think that that's the expectation. My belief is that when somebody says, somebody who doesn't have experience says, I need a website, what they're really saying is, I want you to take my business and somehow figure out how it needs to appear to the world on a web page. That's not a website. That's a market strategy market. It's a business model, business plan, business plan. It's a lot more than just a website. So that's to the graphic designers and website builders. To the business owners, you must create a business model and a business plan and review it annually. If you don't, you are missing out on a lot of opportunity for yourself. Uh, and so take advantage of SCORE, take advantage of this consortium group, take advantage of your friends and family and neighbors and uncles and whoever you can talk to who has experience in this, it's really important to review these things on a regular basis. Uh, and finally, as we'll go, as you'll see as we go along here, I want you to think not, I want you to think about one to many, not one to one. A lot of businesses sell their product or service one customer at a time Hopefully you get paid, sometimes you don't. That's the one-to-one -one model. The one-to-many is what we're gonna talk about tonight. That may change the way you think about your business in the future. Business models, continue. So what changed my way of thinking after 20 some odd years doing consulting in for the electronics industry was I was driving down 95 one day and I looked at the skyline 20 years ago. It didn't look like this, but this was the best picture I could find. Who do you think owns those tall buildings in Philadelphia? It's not people that do business one client at a time. I don't actually know all of them. I think one of them is the Comcast building, and I'm not sure about the other well, other ones there, but 
the idea that these are building, and maybe they're banks as well, these are buildings owned by people who understand alternative business models than the one-to-one -one model, or even the one-to-a-few, as we'll get to in a minute. And that's a really important message. I don't expect you, I mean, I hope all of you in this room end up owning skyscrapers in Philadelphia, not likely, but you could certainly own something more than a chair and a desk in, a, in, a, in your basement. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that. That's how I started, how my wife and I started a lot of years ago. Okay, so there's a definition for a business model, according to Mr. Google. It's a design for the successful operation of a business identifying revenue sources, customer base, products, and details of financing. That's very uh, sterile, but that's what Google says a business model is. And here's a question for the audience. What do you think is the worst business model that you know of? I'm going to ask the worst business model and the best business model. So anybody in the room, what do you think is the worst business model? You, you're, you're reading the slide. She said consulting business model. You're right, amazingly. And what do you think is, you, you can't answer this question, lady. And what do you think is the best business model? Larry? Okay, why don't you tell us? Why is that the worst business model? Why don't you grab the microphone and tell us, please? It's the worst business model because once you solve the client's problem, they don't come back for business. And? And? Do you ever get paid for the last uh, piece of work? I do because I get paid up front. Okay, well, we're going to get to that. Okay, that's a very important point, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Get paid up front. Don't, get, don't wait for the last payment and I'll send it to you next month. That's nonsense. Okay, thank you, Larry. Who, what, who thinks, who, who, think, who can tell us what the best business model is? Or one of the best business models? Yeah, all right, Lydia, you can read the screen. Go ahead. All right. Well, it's the, I'll tell you. It's the razor blade business, and I'll tell you why in a second, although I think you can figure it out. Or the insurance company business model. That's my favorite business model. Here's why. What other business do you know where they charge you up front for 20 or 30 years every effing month for the promise that they're going to pay you something in the future, maybe? And they still get to keep your money. One of those big, tall buildings probably that we saw before, maybe more than one, was from an insurance company. Have you ever seen a small insurance company? No. They have... The sales guys get paid on commission for the most part, right? So that's not a fixed overhead. They get to sell you stuff, and I'm not even going to get into the pros and cons of insurance. There's somebody here that sold insurance? Yeah. All right, you can leave the... Oh, okay, okay. You'll, you'll redeem yourself later. <laughs> but your company, I bet you, gets paid up front, right? For the promise to pay the client something in the future, maybe. Okay, different model. Okay, okay. All right, that, that, good, I'm glad to hear it. Anyway, that's a great model, and we can learn something from that. We're going to get to that in a minute. Okay, so when you start thinking about your business model, you need to think very clearly about what your personal and business goals are. Some people want to make a lot of money fast. That's a great, that's a great goal. That's, then that should be built into your business model. Some people want to work in their basement, with nobody around except their dog or their cat, maybe their spouse, maybe not their spouse, maybe their kids, maybe not their kids, but they, they just want to work alone in their basement, and that's perfectly okay. That's your business model. That's part of your plan and everything in between. So you need to do a really careful assessment of what your skill set is and what uh, your personal and business goals are and use that to shape the model that suits you best. I'm going to talk mostly tonight about making money quickly, or at least making money, <laughs> maybe not so quickly, uh, because that was the goal that I had uh, for a lot of years, uh, and I suffered, I, my family life suffered. Uh, you know, it's the balance. How many people struggle with the uh, life-work balance? Nobody in the room. Okay. That's an issue. I know my friend Tom, raise your hand, Tom. Tom has figured out a way to balance his life and his work in a beautiful way. If you want to tell us about it later, Tom, we would welcome that. Uh, he does very well, and uh, he's figured out a really great model for himself and his family. 
Okay. This is the main slide of the evening. I'm pretty much done after this. Here are the three illustrations of the three models to think about. There's the one-to-one, -one, which is what Lydia was talking about before. You find a client, you do the best job you can for that client, it takes however long it takes, you get paid along the way, and then, except for Larry, you often have to go fight or struggle or, or uh, uh, take time to, to get that last payment. And you just never get ahead financially. You're always running in place. That's, that's the consulting model. I did it for 20 years. I became one of the highest paid consultants in the country, possibly the world in my field. And I was always cash flow behind. And I, I, was, I, paid, I was paid more than anybody else, I think, in the country uh, on a per day basis, but I just could never get ahead cash flow wise. So I can tell you firsthand, it's not a great model. And yet I bet you most of the people in this room are in the one-to-one -one model, uh, use the one-to-one -one model. And then there's the few to few model. And for example, I know some uh, developers and some graphic uh, folks and so on who have a small staff, two, three, four, five people who handle maybe 10, 20 cut clients, something like that. And the advantage of that is that they have specialists. So one person's a copy expert, one person's a graphics expert, one person's a, a WordPress expert, et cetera, et cetera. All the different expertises, is that a word, expertise? And that way you can really be good at what you do and not have to be uh, good at everything. And that's how you can have few to few clients. You'll make more money with that, but then you have the headache of managing people. If you're not a good manager, that's not a good model for you. And, and then you have the few too many. That's the win. And the reason for, and you'll see a, a better explanation in just a minute. If you can figure out what your customers will want from you in an ongoing way and where they're willing to pay you up front and along up front and along the way and be recurring revenue year after year month after month day after day whatever it might be that's the win now that may cause you to think differently about offering your service if you want to build websites one at a time, customized for each individual client, you'll never get into a model like that. But if you want to be in the website business, for example, I was talking to somebody, I don't think they're here right now. They're experts at building websites for people that sell kitchens, of all things. And they have, they're really good at selling web, uh, kitchen websites. So they have lots and lots of clients focused on kitchen websites and, it, and they're much more efficient at that and they provide not only the website tools and, and the hosting and the maintenance and all of that, but they can have a large number of clients on a regular basis, uh, uh, paying them on a regular, uh, on a regular basis uh, with recurring revenue. That's a much better model than a custom website one at a time. And that's why I picked the picture of a large crowd throwing who knows what in the air, but uh, Anyway, that's, that's, I just want you to, to leave today with those three images in your head and in the quiet of night, think about what your customers want and what you can offer them on a regular basis where they will pay you up front on a, on, with recurring revenue. If you could figure that out, it will change your life, I promise you. It changed my life, I can tell you that. Okay, so Harvard... Uh, review, actually, I didn't know this until I did a little more research, actually uh, has an article which reports on the best, what they call the best business model in the world. And uh, there's a link at the bottom there. I can't read it from where I'm standing, so I'll get closer. Whoops. It says, where you get the vast majority of your customers coming back year after year, where the cost to deliver an additional customer approaches zero at scale, and where you get a lot of cash up front. What more could you ask for, right? Uh, Rhonda's business model, which is exactly this, is a wonderful model, right? You sell security, credit card security service. I pay Rhonda's company not a terrible large amount of money, but every month and, and forever, I suppose, 
And the more clients they sign up, the more people pay a fee every month, forever and ever. And if I don't pay, I don't get the service. Well, for me, it's having security with my credit card and so on is something that's important to me. So I will keep paying. And uh, that's an example of one of these models. So that's what Harvard thinks is the best business model. Now, I haven't talked about a business plan yet. You know, we're going to hear from Don in a few minutes. He's now over there. You moved you closer to the exit. I wonder why. Uh, anyway, that's what I want you to take away from tonight, is think about how close you can get to a model like this that will change your financial future, possibly your family as well. So my final comment, and this goes to what uh, Tony said before, one of the, question, one of the uh, uh, things that Lydia has suggested at, at our uh, uh, advisory board meetings is to have uh, a, uh, another meeting during the month, not, only, not the third Monday of the month, but some other day, where we have roundtable discussions. So I'm putting it out to the group here. Would this group like to have a monthly meeting of people sitting around a table where we can together, work together, review your plan, review your business model, review your business plan, review your marketing calendar, and anything else you want to review uh, very informally with, uh, with, uh, with the other people at the table. So just a show of hands, is this something of interest to the group? Okay, about 15 people. So I would say, Lydia, you got a project now. <laughs> See, I told you I asked for volunteers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I know she's going to go to California or something and deal with the mudslides or something. Who knows? Okay. Well, that's basically the end of my presentation for tonight. Uh, I'll be certainly able to take questions now if you'd like, or we could wait till the end, or you can ask a question on Slido. Uh, so any questions before I turn it over to our next presenter? Any questions? Nobody cares. Yes. Grab the mic there, please. Turn it on, please. Number four. Is it on? Out of all... Okay. A little better, yeah. Out of all of your years of business, if you only gave everybody exactly one lesson, what would you want them to know? The one lesson I would like you to know is think outside the box. Don't get stuck in what somebody told you and that little that person is sitting on your shoulder telling you every day, go find a new client. No, go find a hundred new clients. That's the lesson. Thank you. How much do I owe you for that? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we'll take questions at the end. Uh, and now I'm very proud to introduce my friend, Dr. Don Geltz. Uh, after tonight, he may not uh, want to talk to me again, but we'll see. So uh, for brief introduction, Don is uh, an entrepreneur for many, many years and a professor of business at, what's the name of your university? Holy Family University, and uh, he can uh, speak a little bit about the uh, business. So, Don, take it away. I'm going to get your slide back up here. The clicker is forward. So when Don asked me to speak tonight, I know how to deal with Don, so I simply said no, because um, he's not a subtle person. He said, oh, but I'll buy you dinner. And I said, okay, here's the, here's the bill, Don. I know. Surf and surf, I should have heard. Okay. okay. Uh, so, in spite of what Don promises, I am not here to talk about business planning. I'm here to talk about how to refine your business model to get ready to do a business plan. Uh, oftentimes, in score and in other consulting that I've done, people come in and say, I have a great business idea and I've written a business plan. An idea is not a business model. An idea is not a viable business opportunity. And the, the tool that I've used in teaching entrepreneurship, this is ad-libbing while you wait for the slide, um, it went away. <laughs> there it is. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions? There, it, there you go. So, so this is an overview of the business model. Canvas, the business model. Canvas is a tool that was invented in California where all good things happen and all good things end up in the sea eventually. 
And so, um, to deal with the problem of, in the venture capital world, people showing up with a, a ill-conceived business plan, where they had an idea ill-conceived. Closer to the mic, please. Ill-conceived, I hate using a mic. I have a teacher's voice. I can project all the way to the back of the room. Okay, uh, so. The business model canvas was invented by a venture capitalist to cure the problem of an ill-conceived business idea. Uh, it's a very simple model, and we'll go through part of it tonight. I have lots of references on the slides for more information. So this is me. You can tell by this I'm a college professor. Uh, prior to this, I was in the corporate world. That's what I called the first half of my career. Then I was an entrepreneur, all sorts of corporate funded ventures, desktop ventures. I ran an Israeli venture. Anybody want to talk about a crazy experience? I'll be happy to talk about that. And then I got tired and developed the third half of my career, which is being a college professor. I actually went back to school, spent my 60th birthday, that was just yesterday, of course, uh, in class and got a PhD. Uh, so I teach at Holy Family University. I teach largely um, entrepreneurship. I teach a course in digital marketing, which is a scream because I don't know much about digital marketing at all. Uh, I teach senior seminars and, and that sort of stuff. This is the summary chart of the business model. Now, of course, a harebrained college professor made lots of copies of this and left them in his briefcase. But this, the references, if you need this, this, there's lots of versions of this. I like this one because it gives you a brief overview of what this is all about. And you're going to look at this and say, hey, it's a one-page document. It takes a lot more work than that to develop a business model or a business plan. And you're right, because behind this are lots and lots of questions. We're going to go over uh, about half of this chart tonight. On the right-hand side, it's basically what is it that we're doing? So what are the customers? What are the value propositions, the customer relationships and channels? And then on the left-hand side is how do we do it? That is, what resources do we need, activities and partners? And then you can get to the bottom-ish line, which is the revenues and costs. So this is a way of ensuring that your business model is viable. And you don't do this by sitting at your desk. How do you do it? Any ideas on how you? verify that a business model is viable, what do you do? You go out and talk to prospective customers and partners. So this is not simply a desktop exercise. So we're going to go through the first four portions of this. I'll go through it and I'll come back and illustrate how it's used. So you can go back and forth between do you start with the customers or do you start with the, the uh, value proposition. But here we're starting with the customers. Uh, who are the customers specifically? Not we're serving teenagers who live at home, but what specific customers, um, what do you, jobs do you take care of for them? Uh, and one of the couple of key concepts that are developed along with this are ideas like the customer persona. So actually invent a day in the life of a potential customer. So what does this customer do all day? Um, what what are you doing to help them with their day? And also, how to, it tells you how to reach out to them. So this is the first thing you do. Um, you need a value proposition. That is, what are you really offering? What is your salute? What is the problem? What is the solution? And do they care? Uh, I was a founder of a venture with serving trade shows. We were basically a match.com for trade show attendees and trade show vendors. We actually spent a year developing this business concept. We talked to people, we put it out there, people loved it. It turned out they didn't care because what they wanted to do, the attendees did not want to make the process more efficient. They went to trade shows to goof off and, and spend the corporate money. And so did, did they want to make their visit shorter? No. And so it turned out to be a, an awful experience, awful business idea. Um, Third, um, how do you reach them? What are the touch points? What's the customer experience? Um, how do they want to be reached? So you need to ask a lot of questions about this. And the fourth element 
is the customer relationships. Basically, this is sort of marketing. What, how do you, what kind of a relationship do you want to have with each segment? Is it personal, automated, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, one to many? And how do you get customers? How do you keep customers? And how do you grow customers? So let's illustrate this with an idea. So my idea, I'm still I'm looking for the fourth half of my career, by the way. So if anybody actually wants to do this, I'd love to do that. My idea is to serve a customer segment that this audience knows very, very well, which is small businesses that need digital marketing but can't afford it. They don't have the time. They're busy running a micro business of one or two or five individuals in the business, and they don't have the money to spend to really do a, a digital marketing campaign. So that's my customer of the day in the life is too busy running around, getting customers, staying alive. If you're a consultant, you're, you're either too busy consulting or you're out after that, so you've got to go get more customers. So there's no way to actually serve this customer base um, except they need your services. So what's the minimum viable product? The minimum viable product here, I think, could be a pre-can, one-to-many, thank you, Don Brown, uh, approach to providing a basic website, uh, a basic um, email campaign, a basic Facebook page, um, and three or four elements of getting them a beach hold, a toe hold, in the digital marketing world. So I've got a customer segment defined. Um, I've got a minimum viable product. Now I need to go talk to these customers, potential customers, and find out what do they do all day, how would I serve them. So what, how do they want to be reached? Actually, they don't have time for this, and so they need to make it extremely easy. I want to build a scalable venture. I don't want to start a consulting company. I don't want to put on seminars on the weekend at the country club and have 10 possible customers paying $10 to hear me. I want to make this very much one to many. And so I have to make it very easy for them to experience, very easy for them to buy. Here's four things. You pay $399, you get the four things. Okay. And so the customer experience is quite easy. Um, it's very reachable. I do it online, largely. And I have ways of getting and keeping and growing them because by word of mouth and digital marketing, I can address the, this customer. I can also go to meetings like this. I can go to score meetings. I can go to the Chamber of Commerce, the local business associations, and start to get the word out like that. So that's a way of testing my business concept. Is, is it a viable business? What do you think? Could be. The question is, how am I going to do that? So I'd have to go through, I'd have to go through the rest of the chart. I'd have to think about um, what is it that I'm going to do? What is it that I'm going to automate? What are the key activities here? And what kind of resources would I need to do this? Well, I probably need a, a software developer. I probably need some sort of artificial intelligence built in to adapt it to their individual needs. I'd probably need an interactive questionnaire for them to fill out my potential customers. I'd use that data to build the elements of my offering. Partners had lots of potential partners, including uh, Office Depot, including Staples, all sorts of places where my potential customers hang out. So then I could, I'd have to do a, a little bit of a uh, pro forma revenue forecast and a little bit of a pro forma cost context forecast. I had to figure out whether I can actually make money doing this. Sounds good so far, but I'd have to do some calculations. Now, I do this. I teach entrepreneurship. Um, I actually have the students in the class develop a business, a viable, scalable business concept. I have them go through this whole chart. At the end of that, about half of them say, yeah, this is a good business concept, and the other half say, no, no, this doesn't make any sense. And that's probably a, a good um, deterioration rate in using this tool. It's very simple. You'll find that behind this, there's a lot of in-depth thinking 
And there's a lot of resources on how to use this tool. Um, it is not, as I stated whoops, before, a linear process. You need to get out, talk to your potential partners, customers, everybody you can talk to, and then what you're going to find is you're going to have to adapt the business model. This is useful not only for a startup company, but for those of you who are in business, because uh, Crazy Larry has evolved his business model. And the reason he's done that is because the outside world has changed. The outside world doesn't stay uh, the same. And so you have to continually do this to continually update and adapt your business model. Okay, so a, a summary. We're at the summary stage. There's things that it is and it is not. This is not a business plan. You can't take this document that you're going to generate, even as you can plug lots of stuff on this one page, and take and start a business, nor can you fund a business. <clears throat> what you can now do once you get through this is now you're ready to write a business plan because now it's easy. You've asked all the hard questions. So it's easy to write the executive summary, it's easy to write the market potential, and so on and so forth. So a business plan is a very straightforward document if you've done this kind of work. And it is most useful in searching for a viable business model or a growth initiative or a diagnostic tool if your business is in trouble. Um, lots of advantages. It gives you a focus. You have a one-page document that you're trying to fill out. In my class, I have the students take a, a poster board of this and use stickies to answer the questions. And then when they find something else, they put a sticky on top of that sticky. Don't throw it away because maybe the, the, your first thought was useful. Uh, it's very flexible. It's adaptable to a service or a product uh, offering. Uh, it's very transparent because it's all, uh, it's very, um, very much out there. It's very uh, easy to use. And it develops a common language for you and your team to use as you go through this. There's tons of resources. Here's another plug for SCORE. Um, you can go online, search for Business Model Canvas, lots and lots of different ways of portraying this. If you're interested in 140 slide, slide decks, SlideShare has got lots of those. Uh, I have a 10 or 12 slide, uh, slide deck. Um, there is, most importantly, there is a free course. It's extremely well done. Free online course on Udacity. It's called How to Build a Startup. If you simply Google How to Build a Startup, it'll take you right to that course. It's extremely well done, and it goes in much, much more detail uh, on the types of questions you ask at each stage of this. And finally, you can always email me. Uh, my name is Don Geltz. It's dgeltz at comcast.net or holyfamily.edu or yahoo.com or anything else you want. I have lots of email accounts. Um, I am the only person that has this name on Google. So you can actually Google me and you'll find me. Um, I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, by the way. And that's all I have. Depends on who's looking for you. What? Depends on who's looking that's for you. That's true. The IRS always knows where I am. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Anybody want to start a business? Don, over here. Have you... Has anybody actually, uh, can you give us an example of somebody who's actually followed this process with you and has gotten, can you give us a case study essentially? Um, sure. Uh, one of my SCORE clients um, came to us with really no key concept of what he wanted to do. He just wanted to start a business. Um, so we kind of started to walk him through this process. We asked him what he tried. He tried all sorts of stuff. He tried selling, uh, this is hard to believe, he tried to sell vacuum cleaners. And I said, well, why did you do that? He's, he was from Nigeria. He had three or four college degrees that had a career, and he's looking to give back to the community. And it, I said, how many vacuum cleaners did you sell? And his wife laughed. She said, none. And so finally through that conversation and through going through this, we decided that he decided, really, because we don't decide, he decided, to start a business offering immigration services. And, and so we've walked him through this process. He doesn't need funding at this point, but he's um, building a business that is indeed uh, not only supportable, but scalable. Larry, question. So, yeah, you know, 
I've started many businesses and failed at many businesses, and luckily I'm succeeding now. However, one thing that I, I saw that you went through your slides, there were so many pieces right there, it's perfect. Yeah. There's so many pieces to that business, and most of the people in the room are starting a business on a shoestring bu budget. Where do you suggest they start? Well, there, there, these pieces exist in any business, whether it's a one-person business or a thousand-person business. So in any business, you have customers, you have some value proposition that you have to convince them is worth their doing. You have ways of reaching them. You have you need to build a relationship with your customers, and you have ways of delivering what you develop. So it doesn't matter. Um, this has been used in, in corporate America, but that's not necessarily a blessing, but to, to start new segments of their business and do diagnostics. It's most often used in startups. Oh, Larry, I'm going to add. That's a good question. I'm going to add something to what Don said. Not only should you be uh, talking to your customers, but you should be talking to your customers' customers, and your and if possible, your customers' customers' customers, because those are the ones who are driving what your customers want. And most often, I have found that your customers don't really know what their customers or customers' customers want and what changes they're gonna want in the future. And so that's part of the process. I think you gotta go yeah, much well, further up the supply chain. Following the, 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 um, the value chain backwards and forwards is, is a great idea. You can do it, absolutely. Any other questions? Okay. Don, thank you very much. We know where to find you now. Yes, okay. Lydia? Let me take just a moment to introduce Lydia. Uh, <clears throat> I met Lydia when she came to, I think, our first or second uh, consortium meeting. And uh, since then, she's be, been extremely active in the management of the consortium and uh, comes to our uh, monthly uh, advisory panel meetings uh, most for the most part and is, offers many, many valuable suggestions. And uh, so I asked her to share with us her experience at developing a marketing calendar, and I think you'll enjoy what she has to say tonight. So, Lydia, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Don. And she owns and runs Expresso Design, and she'll tell you more about that later. Hello, everyone. I'm Lydia Grosso from Expresso Design. I do graphic design and web design. Um, and I'm here to talk about planning a marketing calendar. So, after you follow, um, you know, discovering what your business model is going to be, and you run through everything that um, both Dons have suggested during this evening, and you've done your market research, you know who your clients are. Is that knocking from here? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and you know who your ideal customers are, you know who your ideal customers are. You've done your market research. You know how your uh, ideal clients want to be communicated with. Uh, you're going to lay out your marketing calendar and pro to promote your business. So you do need, you can't just wing it. Um, I guess you could, but you, it's always best to have uh, a roadmap and, and, a, and a plan to follow ahead. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, so the uh, fourth, yeah, but it's also gone down. Okay, it's fine. It'll work. Yeah, it'll work. <laughs> 
So the four topics, it needs to go a little bit higher. You can do it now. <laughs> And is that going to disappear? <laughs> okay, so the four topics I'm going to co cover tonight is why you should have a marketing calendar, what should be on your marketing calendar, implementing, I'm sorry, tools um, that you can use to set up your marketing calendar, and implementing items on your marketing calendar. Why use a marketing calendar? Does anybody know? to plan ahead. So top reasons. You're gonna plan your sales and promotions ahead of time. You're going to promote your business with consistency and efficiency. You're going to increase your business and your product's visibility through and, and increase the brand recognition. Um, you're going to help level out that feast or famine cycle that happened to most one-to-one -one or one-to-few business. And it's ultimately, if done right, is going to help um, increase your sales and revenue. Who here has a marketing plan or a marketing calendar? Okay, not many people. Okay. Do you use your marketing plan calendar all year? Yes. Okay. Nobody ditches it mid midway? Does somebody, somebody else raise their hand? That they, no, no, that's different. It's just ditching it completely, like start using it at the beginning of the year and then give up. No? Okay. All right, so we'll skip that one. Um, so here are a few reasons, because I think that a lot of you can identify with these reasons. Reasons for not using a marketing calendar. You're not sure what to put on it. You don't have enough time to sit down and plan. You don't have time to follow through with the tasks and implement them. Tasks are too complicated. And don't, you don't have a system or tools to keep the plan on track. Can anybody identify with any of those items? Somebody call out a few of the items on that list that you can identify with. Okay. You don't have a system, okay, that, that'll help you keep on track and follow through. Okay, yeah, I think that those are the most common issues that small business, business owners run into. It's time, how am I gonna do this? You know, you start planning, you have great ideas, but then you get overwhelmed, and you just end up not doing it at all. Okay, so let's cover a few things that should be on the marketing calendar. So what do you put on a marketing calendar? Anything that you want, you would want to promote, announce um, to your current clients, potential clients, um, and customers, and to the world in general. So it could be anything. It could be something as small as your first year anniversary, your fifth, fifth year anniversary, or you're launching a new product, you're relaunching that product, you've revamped that product, you've revamped your website. Anything. It could be, you, you may think that people may not want to hear about that, but some people do. Your clients may want to know that you're actually investing in your business and making improvements and making improvements for their benefit, potentially. Um, and tasks that, that you need to complete um, to make your prom promotions and announcement possible. So it could be anywhere from checklists. So let's say you're gonna come up with a social media plan. What do you need to do to get that social media plan implemented. What are the steps? Do you need to take pictures of your product? Do you need to write out those social media posts ahead of time? Um, do you need to get somebody to help you do those tasks? So everything should be laid out, and it could be as simple as just a simple checklist. But for each item that you put on your marketing calendar, you should have a small task list of what it is that you need to do to get that task implemented. And that takes us, leads us to the last step here, steps you need to take to put your promotion announcement out into the world. So are you going to post on Twitter? Are you gonna post on Facebook? Do you have an account set up? Are you going to you know, write a blog post and then po post on Twitter? 
do you need to get a copywriter to write some of that copy for you to get it implemented? Do you need a graphic designer to design something flashy that'll pick, you know, catch people's eye on social media? Because there's a lot of competition out there. You really have to grab people's attention. So all of these things have to be, you have to think all of this through. You know, sometimes you can just wing it, but if it's planned out and well planned out, it will get you better results. Okay, so things to put on your mar marketing calendar. Important dates, product launches, trade shows, conference events. You wanna tell people that you're gonna be at these events. You wanna tell people you have a speaking event. You wanna tell people that you're gonna be there so people will come out and see you. Seasonal promotions and sales. Do you have a Black Friday sale that's coming up? Start announcing it, but you have to prepare your graphics, your content, and what you're gonna be saying. And you can't be saying the same thing every single time because people will get tired of it. So switch it up a little bit, tweak it a little bit. You have to plan all of that ahead of time. Company product and, and company or product anniversary. You know, it's a big deal. Hey, our product is one year old today. You know, you may think, well, it's no big deal to me, but some people like hearing that. Hey, congratulations. You wanna get people engaged with you and your brand. And you know, hey, you made it through the first year. That's fantastic. That's a big hurdle to get across. Why not announce it? You know, get some people to congratulate you for it. Um, milestones, any, any milestone you can think of, just name it. Or even let's say it's um, World Coffee Day. I forget what, <laughs> what day it is, but I did, you know, that's a post that I put out last year. Hey everybody, you know, go get some caffeine. It's World Coffee Day. That's my business theme is based on coffee and caffeinated stuff. Um, content pitches and the schedule. So on your calendar, you're going to put, um, scribble down any ideas that you have for social media posts. What are you gonna be talking about in the next month, in the next quarter, the next year? You should uh, potentially plan out what you wanna do at specific points during the year and then connect the dots. If, you know, starting small, you would um, ideally start that way. Um, but you do have to plan out your social media posts and your blog posts ahead of time. So if there's something big that you do, an event or a product launch or something that's coming out, say in July, you should be planning ahead for this by January. You should have a loose plan of what you're gonna be doing to get to that point and promote that event, that product launch, whatever it is in July. Um, you're gonna put down you know, your email marketing campaigns, digital and print ads, if that's something that you do, website updates, seasonal and social media, cover photo updates, maybe you need that. You know, you're gonna be promoting a specific thing, specific event, event. maybe you need to just change out your cover photo, photo on all your social media platforms and um, any printed materials that you need to get. Do you need to get new business cards? Are you running out? You know, if you're going to a trade show, make sure you have business cards. It's something as basic as that to put on your, your calendar. Maybe postcards, something with your booth number, your website, just to hand out to people. Schedules, deadlines, go live dates, deployment dates. That needs to be on your calendar because if you have that event coming up in July, you need to know when you need to get those printed materials in-house in time for you to take to your event. Um, if you need to get a copywriter to do things for you, you need to have that ready you know, for some big blog post or, or some big announcement. You need to have that copy ready way before you get your printed items done. Or if you need to update your website, you need to get that copy done way before you're gonna send that copy to your web designer, web developer to put it on your website. And you need to have a specific date that you're gonna get those updates done on your website and when you want them to go live. Your email campaigns, when are you gonna deploy them and start announcing, making these big announcements to clients. So all of this should be, you know, you should plan your event on your calendar and then backtrack from it. And, and set deadlines for when all of these item, items need to be done. You also need to break down the tasks and items that need to be completed and each item on your list. 
and who will be completing each task. So are you going to be getting a work colleague, an employee, or you're going to be hiring out some of these tasks? You need to make these decisions ahead of time, and you need to put them down on your calendar, just so that you don't, you know, you don't miss the boat on, on some of these, these tasks that need to get done. So what tools should you use to set up a marketing calendar? Any system that works for you and you can, that keeps you on task. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be pen and paper, wall or desk calendars, sticky notes, Excel spreadsheets. I don't really advise just loose sticky notes, by the way, around. You know, you would usually stick the sticky notes on a calendar or something you know, that you can refer back to. Excel spreadsheets, Word docs, and there are tons of online, online apps to help you keep, keep you on track. Examples of marketing calendars that I have. This I borrowed from my friend Steph Side's Social Chicky. This is what they call a Kanban style board. She takes a desk calendar and she just put sticky notes of all the things she needs to do on that month. So this was April of last year that she has here. But she has all of the tasks. And then these are just simplified um, items that she has here. Then she later elaborates what she's going to do for each of these tasks. And she, she actually does this on paper and sticky notes. This is the way she finds that works best for her and it keeps her on task. I personally could never do this. <laughs> I could not stick with it. I'm a digital techie geek, and I need to do something like Trello. I, I, I don't get any. I don't get any. Um, I don't have any affiliation with Trello. I use Trello. It's a. It, you can use a free version. Thank you. <laughs> you can use a free version. Um, there is a paid version that just gives you different um, power ups, is what they call. So they're different add-ons. Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. Um, but it's free. The basic version is free. You can use, I think, one power up per board. And what this does is you can set up on, with boards, and then each of these, these little white things, they're called lists. And within those lists, each different item is a card. And each card can be expanded, and you can keep it as simple as possible, or you can enter as much detail about those items as possible. So this is a little closer look at some of the lists and the cards on them. You can add due dates. You can attach files to them. You can make check, checklists within them. And you can add team members to them. And a team member can actually be just you know, your content writer. If they have a free Trello account, they can set up a free Trello account, you add them to that card and assign a task to them and give them a due date. Now this, um, I pulled this offline from Inman.com and it's uh, very real estate or oriented, so I know there are a lot of real estate agents here. You may want to check that out. Um, but I just wanted to give you a better idea of how to use it. And so, so here we have um, some content brainstorming ideas. And you can just use the cards just to write down a topic. I want to write these five blog posts in the next two months. And then you go into the card and you can just detail as much, as little or as much as you want. Yeah. Well, by other members on the team. Yeah. Yeah, as you have to add, as long as you add the members to that card, you can have conversations within it. So right there, um, Sean Price is adding comments. If there were another team member, he could actually comment on it with an at symbol with that other team member's name, and that team member would be notified that there's a message in there for him. And then you can have a conversation within that card to that specific task itself without just throwing it out there you know, and have this huge thread on different boards that have nothing to do with the one project. So you can go in there, have conversations about that specific task. Can you tie that to uh, clients? 
to what? To clients? Yes, if they have a Trello account and, and they want it. And so I do most of my business, I, I organize most of my business, all of my client projects, all on Trello. Personal life, client projects, you name it. Uh, marketing calendar, I do everything on Trello. And I keep track. So if I'm building a website, I go in there, I put the, you know, the colors that I'm using for that website, I put all the typefaces, what was that? They do. They have a phone app, they have um, a Mac desktop app, and then they have the online version. So whatever it is that works for you, and I use it on all my devices. So. Trello really, is also a CRM, is it not? Um, Co contact Relation Manager? No, it's not a CRM. Maybe there's a power up or some add on that makes it, um, but I don't use it as a CRM. But you could because you could just essentially create a bunch of cards in there, one for each client, and set a due date to follow up with them. And initially I did use it as a CRM, but I, don't, I find it a little clunky to use it that way, unless there's, I didn't look into a power up for that. But, so you can also add, if you add a calendar power up to it, then you can view it in calendar mode. So you set up those, you know, those lists and those cards, you set due dates for everything, and then you click on the calendar um, thingamajigger up there, and you get to see it on the calendar, what it looks, what does your monthly calendar look like? And so, and this is, I find for me that this is a great way to keep things, whether it's a simple task or something, or a very complex project, it keeps everything together, you never lose anything. Once a project is done and it's gone, you can archive it, but then you can always, all, always re-access it re-access that information. Could you create a, a calendar on the Google Calendar that would be your uh, marketing calendar and then just look at that when you need to and have that integrated with all of the other calendars you have? Or can, can Trello be integrated with Google Calendar? It can. It can be integrated with Google Calendars and you can use Zapier to connect it with multiple other apps that will, you can have it connected to your uh, Google email, to your G Suite email, and then just have whenever a, sp a specific email from specific projects or clients come in, you can have Zapier program it to just create a new card for each email that comes into a specific mailbox in Gmail. There, the possibilities here are endless. Um, a lot of uh, agencies, production people, video production people use um, Trello to high level. So you can use it for very basic things or you can use it at a very high level. I assume that uh, if you had a virtual assistant somewhere in the Philippines or someplace like that, this would be a wonderful way of uh, integrating their workflow with your workflow. Yes, and you can use it with local virtual assistants as well. <laughs> Promoting the local business folks. <laughs> Hire a local VA, please. <laughs> Keep money in America. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sorry. We need work too. <laughs> Americans need work too. Um, so, um, so the, but you know, there are countless tools out there like this. There's, I think Asana is very similar. This is, you know, again, this is, um, this is a very similar format. It's a Kanban style, just like that, um, the calendar with the sticky notes. But this is obviously much more detailed than just you know a paper uh, calendar. Lynn, we use it um, for one of our committees that uh, our board of directors is in charge of. We have an IT committee, mm -hmm. and so all our people are local, and we have all the Trello sticky notes happening. Yeah, it's fantastic. So it's, it's you can good for board initiatives and and make people accountable and due dates and right. action items. Yes. Right, and then you can have conversations with it and everything stays in one spot relating to that one project or that one task. It's fantastic. You don't have to sift through, you know, a hundred emails and what email was that information on? What would be, I don't, I don't know how well this integrates, but once you've accomplished a task, is there some way of capturing the results of that task, compare those results with previous tasks of similar nature so that you know how to make adjustments for future tasks? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, tie it to the Google Analytics, for example. Is there some way of doing that? Mm, possibly. I don't know. I've never done that. 
So maybe there is a power up or maybe there's a way to con connecting them with Zapier. I've never done that in particular, but you could um, do a follow up and post notes within. Um, there's a section, you can add notes, you can add a variety of, um, of different functionalities. You can attach documents, maybe you can take a Google, get a PDF of your Google Analytics result or an Excel spreadsheet and just attach it to this so that you can come back to it later and compare in the future. And that's why I think it's fantastic. There's so much that you can put on these cards and just keep all that information from that one task there and keep it archived. You, you know, as long as you don't delete it, you're not gonna lose that information. Um, oops, I'm going, I'm going the wrong direction. Wait, ah, no, I'm right, okay, sorry. Sorry there, um, implement, implementing your marketing calendar. So this would be, how are you going to, what do you need to do to get all of this that you've planned out into the world? Um, so for one, once you start doing this, since most of you don't have a marketing calendar, don't overwhelm yourselves. I know it's easy to, you, th you have a hundred different things that you wanna do. Pick the top five or one a month that's really important and start there and start planning, backtracking, and planning those tasks. And once you get comfortable with whatever tool it is that you choose to use, whether it is Trello, paper, um, if you find another tool that you find is easier um, and, and that you click with a little bit better, start with one task a month, or maybe just the first five for the first semester of the year. Um, but just keep in mind that future tasks may be connected and what you do now may affect what you're gonna be doing further down the road. So that's why it's always good to plan, you know, for a year ahead of time, but then go tweaking as, as you move forward with your promotions because, you know, you're not gonna set a one-year calendar and then stick to it rigidly. Things change or depending on how your clients interact with you or respond to what you've done, you may have to change things and change how you're going to be promoting that other promotion for Black Friday or whatever it is further down the road. Um, so be flexible. Don't overwhelm yourself. You have to be flexible. Start small and then expand so that you can get comfortable with it. Get reliable help. Do you have a business partner, a family member, or an employee that, that you can delegate some of the tasks to or just split it up, say, I'm gonna do this half, you do that half. I'm gonna do these tasks, you handle those tasks. Um, if you're a solopreneur, then hire reliable help. Virtual assistants are inexpensive, um, and they can be, they're very tech-oriented, they know how to use specific tools, they know how to use social media. Different VAs have different um, specialties. So find somebody that can help you out, and you'd be surprised. Some of them charge in the, around this area, they charge between 20 to $30 an hour, but you'd be surprised how much they get done in that hour, and how much stress that takes off your shoulders, knowing that your promotion is getting done. Um, you can hire, you know, copywriter, graphic designer, social media specialist, just to do small tasks because all of these tasks add up and what you think is going to take you five to 15 minutes will eat up five hours. You know, once you get down that rabbit hole, five hours have gone out the window and you didn't, you weren't doing the work that's actually bringing you money now. So, you know, Make room in your budget to pay a VA or some other professional for a few hours a month to help you um, get these tasks done. So then we have a little recap. So you're going to plan your marketing calendar, just do some loose planning for the whole year, and then you're gonna work through it maybe whatever works for you. Maybe by the quarter, you get more granular every quarter, and, and depending on your results in that quarter, then you plan the following quarter. Um, what should be on your marketing calendar? It should be everything. What, if, are you doing social media? Are you doing video? Are you doing email campaigns? Do you need to update your website? All of that stuff. Do you need new bis business cards? And all of the, the checklists and items that need to go into place for you to get those tasks done. What tools are you gonna use? Figure out what you're comfortable with. Is it just an Excel spreadsheet? Do you wanna try out Trello? Figure out what tool is gonna make you stick to the task 
and stick to your calendar all year round and go, go with it. And then implementing, do you need help? Can you do it all on your own? Figure that out, do you, can you find somebody reliable that's gonna do the work for you for free? Or can you find somebody reliable that is gonna be fairly inexpensive to help you out? And then rinse and repeat. This is a continual process, you're, not, you're never done with it. It's a cyclical thing and you're always gonna have to adapt and listen to what your customers want, what their customers want from them to help you promote your business better. And here, I, I, on my slide, I have um, a link to Trello with some inspirations. They have uh, some loose templates um, for different types of promotions, different calendars, a blogging topic calendar and things. So you may want to check that out and just have a look and see some of the templates that they offer. What do they charge? <clears throat> Not the free version, but the paid version. Um, the gold version that allows, I think, three to four power-ups on one board is like four something a month, four dollars. Four dollars a month? Yeah, it's about forty dollars a year. It's very inexpensive. And that's my bio. You guys can read about it later. And that's that. Don't, don't go very far because we're ready for questions. Okay. So now is the Q&A time. Uh, so Don, would you care to come up front and I'll come up front as well? Uh, actually, I'm going to stay here because there may be some questions on Slido. So I'll bring that up wow. on the screen. Okay. Questions from the audience? Questions. Don't be shy. Come to the microphone, please. No. Tom, you don't have any questions? Okay, I am admittedly not the most creative uh, part of our partnership, um, but Don and I have had lots of conversations about business models in these years, and uh, I understand that your favorite model is what you call the insurance model. I sometimes call it the subscription model. Every time you sign up for People Magazine or Fortune or whatnot, you're doing the same thing as the insurance model. You're paying in advance for service you haven't received yet, and then the company gets to dole out their services over the course of the year, but they've already got your money. And that's a great model. But I'm having trouble seeing how that can be applied to many, many kinds of industries. I'm thinking, for one, the one that we're familiar with, the, the house flipping business, is by nature a one-on-one -on -one uh, business and once you've sold a house to this guy, he's not coming back year after year to buy another house from you. So I don't know how to apply that in in many other kinds of businesses. Maybe you can help me with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> uh, so Marty is my wife in case you guys don't know this and I was not expecting that question. Uh, <laughs> So I'll give you my answer. I actually did think about that. Yeah, I'm sure I you did. Because I knew you, somebody would ask that. The answer is flipping may not be the right business for you. Now, I know I have several of our uh, flipping <laughs> friends here, but is Tom Gillis still here? Did he, he was leave? here. He just left. He just left. <laughs> oh, he just left. Okay. So Tom is in the business, and both Toms. Is Tom, the other Tom, he, he left early? Oh, Okay. Do any of the real estate people, pardon me? Okay, are any of the real estate people here uh, have rental apartments? One, okay, Larry, of course, and, oh, okay, so few people. So if you wanna be in the one-to-many business, buy an apartment building with 100 units, right? Who's giving me thumbs up? Okay, uh, Larry, what would you say to that? You don't want to be a CEO. I don't want to be an apartment building CEO. No, but you have managers. I understood. Okay. Yes. So Tom, that's what uh, I mean. Tom Gillis, who just left, I agree. has I agree. Uh, an apartment manager who manages all of his apartments. And so the answer to where'd Marty go? <laughs> she left. So maybe flipping is if if the one to many model is what you want to adopt, flipping may not be the right model for you unless you apply it to 
multiple units at one time. So that would be the answer to your question. I did think about that. Is that satis huh? It, did that is that satisfactory? Or do I need to answer it a different way? Okay. Here's, here's, yes. a, here's another answer. Yeah, come to your microphone, please. Come to the microphone. Please. Okay, here's another answer. You could look at the value chain of the flipping industry. It has lots and lots of suppliers. It has lots and lots of people who want to be flippers. It has lots and lots of financial elements, insurance elements. And so you could raise yourself up the value chain. Instead of being a flipper, you could train flippers. You could finance flippers. You could form a group of contractors and who are the contractor flippers and so on and so forth. So manage different elements of the value chain. You don't have to stay with the business model that you have today. You can take that knowledge that you've gained painfully and leverage it up. A perfect example of that is Angie's List. Yes. Right? So Angie's List, um, it's one to many, right? They have a website and people sign up to find a plumber or electrician or whatever. So you have all these uh, service people paying Angie X dollars a lead, X dollars a month, whatever their model is. Yep. And Angie's list is a website and they have people that manage taking those orders and so on. But that's a one to many model. It's it, exactly it, what you're it, talking any about. Any kind of a platform like that is by its nature a one to many. Um, instead of being a service provider to the elderly, which we do in our spare time, you can form We are the elderly, Don. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was offering that earlier. Um, you can form an agency that lists and verifies and provides insurance for and, and so on and so forth for other um, providers. And so there's lots and lots of different ways of thinking outside the box. Thinking outside. That's right. So I can give a slightly different perspective on that question. Um, the elderly question? No, the, the, the sort of the referral side of it. Okay. So there are there are many, many businesses out there where the way that you get new customers is through referrals. And many, many consultants really live and die by the ability to get referrals. So I would suggest that in a referral business, the challenge is, is understanding what's valuable to the referrer. Why would they refer you in the first place to other people? And how can you facilitate those referrals through your business model and your business process? Because that's a way of building your network. So that's, you were saying one to many. This is many to one from the other perspective. Um, and we, we have uh, some, some clients that are highly successful at building referral networks um, through their process. And it can be very effective and oftentimes lower cost than you would think from a business process point of view. So just another way to look at the same question. I would argue that no matter how many referrals you get, unless you have a large team of people doing all the business, it, it's still the one-to-one -one business model. You may have many feeding you leads, but you still can only do one. Well, no. The, well, the, that's because you have it set up that way now. You could change it tomorrow yes. if you that's wanted true. to. You just have to want to. Uh, somebody, uh, I'm not sure if they're still here, but somebody called me earlier today, and uh, I made I made a comment at uh, one of our last meetings about how I used to charge for our service. Uh, is uh, Pat still here? Okay, Pat, do you want to ask your question, and I'll answer it as best I can, or would you rather be answer what you asked earlier? Uh, we can answer. Okay. So what I said at our last meeting was that. Uh, I like to charge as much money as possible and maybe even a little bit more for whatever I do. Uh, but I also want to give a lot more value than whatever it is I charge. So it's giving lots of value for lots of money. That's a good model. Uh, so that's the answer. I think that's the answer to your question. You want to give maximum value, but in return, you should charge the most you can. And so there's, you asked me before about pr pricing. I don't know exactly what you're offering, but just look around to your competitors, find out what they charge, find out what they do, offer more and charge more. And tell your customer that you're worth it. Simple as that. And then you gotta deliver, of course, <laughs> small detail. Yeah, that's what Cody says, that's what he does. I wanna know what it is you're offering, but. Do you want to tell us? 
When I do physical assessments for people's security at their actual buildings, it's $500 an hour. There you go. And believe me, he puts you in so much pain, you're willing to give him $505 an hour. Yes, somebody raised their hand before? Did you have your hand raised, somebody? Okay, sorry. Any other questions? Oh, so, yeah, there's questions on Slido. So, uh, Anonymous asked, what business model do you use now in your business? I don't know who that person was referring to. Is it, who is it? Raise your, is that person that's still in the room? Okay, so Don, what business model do you use now in your business? I, I've decided to change my business model. Instead of teaching, I'm going to invite every one of you to be a guest speaker at one of my classes. There you go. Uh, and that and way you, I don't have to do any work. That's right. Just you just keep it you just keep a calendar and she'll help you there keep you a go. calendar. There you go. So that's the business model you adopt, okay? Lydia? I I currently use a one to one business model, but after um, this evening's presentation, I'm going to reconsider that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> don't don't agree so quickly with Larry. You don't know. No, that you don't know what he's asking you for. That's the, yeah. Can I just make a comment on the you know one on one to one business sure. model, etc. I mean, again, um, in in my business, both the current one and and other businesses that I have. A lot of it is one-to-one, -one, especially in market research, because the issue that your client has is a unique situation. But I will say, and this again, uh, I guess, goes to the scalability of the whole issue, you need to be able to scale. And to do that, what you do is you, you learn the ropes very quickly. If your client wants a questionnaire, guess what? It's going to be one of these three different buckets. It's a customer satisfaction survey. Is it going to be a new product design survey? Is it going to be a concept development or message development? Any of these things I already have in my mind and we have templates or questionnaires that have worked very well in the past. So guess what? We just change the name of the product and the brand and there you go. It's a many to many uh, thing. To facilitate. It's, you still have to tweak it a little bit, but for the most part, you don't have to start from scratch every single time. So the same thing applies probably for the flippers in the audience. You know, learned a few things. We can put, oh, just slap a, you know, a drywall on this and slap some paint over there, make it look pretty, and boom, you're done. So what could be taking, you know, four, four hours in each time, you might take four hours the first time, the second one might be only an hour and a half. And you also know how to kind of deploy contractors through that. Just, to, just my two cents on this. Thank you. If you do that, you don't stay in the flipping business for, for very long. Uh, but did you want to say something, Don? No, what what uh, what a lot of consultants do is do what's called multi-client. That's studies. what I was going to just say. And so okay. you can take that knowledge of the industry and peddle it to multiple clients over and over and over again. And you even can even do that on a subscription basis. So you can sign up for you know five years worth of your multi-client studies. So lots of different ways of doing that as well. So I'll give you a concrete example of that in my consulting business. Where's NJ? There he is. Um, I was getting just burn out doing the one-to-one -one, uh, consulting business. So I decided to do a, actually a whole series of multi-client studies. And the first one I did was $23,000 a copy. And I sold it to, I think it was around 30 or 40 companies. I don't can't multiply that in my head right now, but that was a pretty good piece of work. And it was the same piece of work, same amount of research, sold to whatever it was, 30 companies. And I did it again for another another uh, project, which was called Electronic Packaging in Japan. And I'm not talking about cardboard boxes, but anyway. So to do that, I had to go to Japan. Well, I couldn't afford to go to Japan or charge one client enough money to afford for me to go to Japan for six months and do the research. So did a multi-client study. I forgot how much I charged. I sold it to a bunch of people, collected about uh, 200 and some odd thousand dollars, went to Japan for six months and did the work. And the result of that was my client said, Thanks for doing the work. Let's keep it going. And uh, that resulted in another business that I started. So multi-client studies are a great way to take a one-to-one, -one, now maybe not so much web development, although we'll have to talk a little more about that, and get lots of people to pay this, pay lots of money for the same hour of your work. You should make a couple of thousand dollars an hour doing one-to-many. Think about that, boys and girls. <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, 
Think of, think of the person who invented Amway, right? One, one to many, 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 many. <laughs> lots, lots of deals. Well, it's, that's one to many, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? It's nine o'clock exactly on the dot. Did you? There's most? a question on Slido. Oh yeah, let me says, keep looking at Slido. Do you recommend using Hootsuite? Hootsuite, right. Um, well, it, it depends on how you're using it and what you're using it for. I know Facebook doesn't like posts that are scheduled from other apps outside of Facebook. Facebook has its own scheduler. So I've uh, spoken to a lot of social, social media specialists and they don't recommend using Hootsuite for Facebook. Um, you know, I think Hootsuite is a great tool or um, there's another one that's similar to it that slips my mind. But it, um, Buffer, yes, it's Buffer, exactly. That too, Sprout. So there are several tools out there, but I think the two top ones are Hootsuite and Buffer. And, you know, if they can free up your time and you can plan all your social media posts for the week or for the next two weeks, and then you schedule them to go out, I think that's fantastic. Now, try to tailor your posts and, um, and give clients a little bit of insight in your, your thought process on if you're, sharing, um, if you're sharing a post that wasn't authored by you, which is 100% okay. If you don't have time, that's one thing I forgot to add to my presentation. If you don't have time to write your own posts and you can't hire a copywriter, there is nothing wrong with taking a post that's already out there from some market leader and putting your insights, adding your insights to it. So share that link to that blog post and say what you think about it or how you can help your clients apply that that is being discussed in that post. There's nothing wrong with recycling information that's already out there as long as it's useful and relevant. Um, and then adding some of your own information, schedule you know, your, blog, your, your uh, social media posts for the week and then you don't have to worry about it or get you know, family to get your VA to post them, but write them out and just free up, that'll free up a lot of your time using tools like that. There are tons of tools out there that can help you free up time by scheduling things in advance. Next question is. What CRM do you suggest? I use um, HubSpot. I use the free version of HubSpot. I think it's fantastic and it does, it has a, a an amazing amount of information that you, you can enter there and help you um, follow up with clients, uh, and it's free. You know, you have to have, I think, one million contacts or something crazy for you to um, qualify to, or fall into the bucket that you have to pay to use their service. So, <clears throat> let's see our, I don't know who asked that question, but there are more CRMs than there are fish in the sea, I think. And they vary from the simplest to the most complex, from, from free to very expensive. It depends on your skill level, it depends on what you want to accomplish, and so on. It's not a simple question. So who asked that question? Is that person still in the room? Yes. Yeah. All right, Rhonda, tell us, what is it that you want the CRM to do? I'm a little <laughs> bit familiar with HubSpot, but can you go into how easy it is to use or how complicated? Well, um, I think, well, it, it can get, you can get very granular with HubSpot, and then you can also um, add on their sales tool, and then that you have to start paying for. The, the CRM itself is free. Um, so if you're just using that to follow the clients, that's all I use it for. If I'm not using it at any high level. I'm using it at a very basic level with what they give you for free. And it's a fantastic tool to keep me on track in following up with clients, following up with, with leads. I get a, I got, in the past month and a half, I just got a ton of leads from somebody messaging me on Facebook, somebody sending me an email, somebody sending me an email saying that they referred somebody to me. Um, and so I just put all of that into HubSpot, add notes, and I add tasks and reminders for me to connect with that person at a specific date and time to follow up so that that doesn't fall you know, through the cracks. That's all. Have you ever been to the Philadelphia HubSpot user group? I have not. Yeah, I was there last year. Okay, how was it? It was a good network. Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know anybody around here had ever been That's something to that. that I'll look into. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, does that okay. answer your question for now? Yeah. One more. We could do an entire meeting just on CRMs. There's yeah, we could. There's a, lo there's a lot to cover there. Yeah. 
Okay, the next question is, uh, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Anonymous said all major slides should have been passed out as, a, as handouts. Uh, I didn't get some of the slides until this afternoon, <laughs> or at least one slide anyway. Uh, they'll all, if you want the slides, because all the, this is all going to be recorded, so the movies will be posted. Uh, but if you want the slides, I'll just uh, put them up on uh, uh, Google Drive, and I'll send everybody a link when I send out the thank you letter for tonight. So who was anonymous that asked that? Was that you? Oh, the 90 days. Well, I'll get to that next. Or did we miss that? Oh, we, we missed yeah, there that. Are, there are two. Um, yes, there's that one. Right. What do you think about breaking um, your year into focused 90 day marketing plans? Absolutely. I mean, that's what I mentioned in my presentation. You can break it up into quarters, into semesters, year. But I think you should have a loose one whole year plan just so that you know what that what you're focusing on these 90 days are ultimately going to lead you, you know, or, or lead to the next quarter, and you can um, you can put everything together seamlessly. If that makes sense, you know, you, you do have to have a broader vision of where you're going with this, as opposed to just working in quarters. You do need to have a, an objective. And, and a long-term objective. There should always be long-term and short-term objectives for anything that you do in your business. And you know, that 90-day plan is just a smaller piece of a, of a larger puzzle. So I mean, everything should connect. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Real quick on the last comment too, if you want the slide decks, go to the consortium website or go to the YouTube channel and watch the videos that Don has so kindly put together because they will all have all the slide decks in them along with the speaker content. And uh, we've started indexing them. So if you want to hear Lydia's presentation and not either of ours, because hers is always much better, there'll be a button that'll take you directly to her, uh, uh, the first uh, moment of her presentation and skip by uh, Don and my presentation. So uh, just that'll save you a lot of time to get get to the good stuff. And if I can add something, um, if, if you're new to the group or if you haven't become a member on the Bucks County Marketing and WordPress Consortium dot org uh, website, please become a member on the site because that way you can get access to all of the videos and all of the content when you log in as a member. As and Don mentioned earlier um, in the evening that we're redesigning the website and it, we're trying to make it a more um, seamless um, process for, for our members and to bring more value to our it's members. It's like Shoemaker's Children, right? We, as <laughs> yes. the website consortium, we don't have the greatest website, but we're gonna fix that. We're working on it. Lydia, last question's for you. Okay, Let me, I can't read it here. I'm gonna read it, it says, can you suggest affordable tools for scheduling your social media marketing posts to various channels? Right, so Ho Hootsuite and Buffer have free versions. Uh, they're limited, Hootsuite, can allow you to connect up to three social media accounts to it. And Buffer, I think, allows five or something like that. So that's that's what I recommend, is trying to stay within, if you know, if you don't have the budget for, um, for their paid plans, because they can get a little pricey, uh, just try to stick within the realm of what they offer you for free. Okay. Allows for three under the free plan and five if you pay. I think that's what I, I have a free version. Okay. And I thought it was. Yeah, I thought they yeah. offered more than Hootsuite. And also, it does allow you to go to Facebook, but it just wants you to put some text in there, along with the post. Right. They have different parameters on. Like, but the thing with Facebook is that Facebook itself doesn't like outside schedulers. They want you to use their tools. And so social media specialists advise not using Hootsuite and Buffer to post to Facebook. Go into Facebook, use their own scheduling tool, and, and schedule your post through there. It's a little more work, but they think that it, it, it will give you a little more um, viewing time. Your, your post will show up on people's news feeds. I mean, Facebook is is finicky. They're very tricky to work with and get your posts visible. They really do want to pay, want you to pay for ads. Ultimately, is what they want you to do. Yes, uh, certain uh, Eastern countries have done a good job of that. I think. 
That's, that's our next workshop. Yes. Repeat the yes. comment because we didn't catch that. I, well, we oh, didn't get oh, recorded. She said, so, so she was asking if Facebook gives a uh, preference to posts that are scheduled within Facebook scheduler as opposed to um, something that was scheduled on Hootsuite and Buffer. Yes, that's what, that, that's what social media specialists say, that Facebook um, prefers that you use their own scheduler. And obviously they prefer that you boost your post with that. <laughs> so before we adjourn tonight, I'm going to ask for, uh, Larry, I'll get you the mic in just a second. So I did something that Facebook really didn't like a lot, and they now have blocked me. Uh, so if anybody in this room is quite knowledgeable about a Facebook, I would welcome your help. Just see me before you leave or send me a note or something. I could really use your help on that. I, what happened was I, announcing this meeting, I, I sent it out to about 100 so-called friends, you know, sent out the, uh, uh, a message to 100 friends, and Facebook said, oh, that's too much, and they blocked me. I, I can't. I, yeah, they'll probably unblock you. Yeah, they do it for oh, a few hours today. Oh, the message sounded much more onerous than that. I was abusing the feature that they made available, but they don't tell you that. Yeah. Two hours? Okay. Well, because, and, and, and Marie asked, why are they doing that? And I think that the reason is they, they want to, um, they don't want to encourage spamming. So if you're sending you know, a message to 100 friends, maybe you should have a group or you should post it on your page and then share your page to, with your friends. You shouldn't be direct messaging over 100 people because that's kind of spammy. If you have a group, this is the best. If you have a group, all the members in the group, get you messaged. can spam. Yeah, they get messaged. That's yes. the cool thing. You can message, message people in oh, the stand group. Up. Okay. Right. So that would be yeah. the best way to do it as opposed to direct messages. Some of these were in the group and some of them were not. But if so. you have an event, you could click all in the group. You don't even have to go click one, one by one like you do yeah. with your friends. Right. You could click all and you can send all to the group. I yeah. love it. Yeah, okay. So well, I have a bunch of groups because of that. Okay. Yeah. Because but, technically people have subscribed to that group and they want to receive mm -hmm. messages yeah. from that group. When you're direct messaging someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that they really want to receive messages yeah. from you. It's the same thing as you know emailing I also tried an experiment also for this meeting. For the first time, I sent out uh, text messages as opposed to, e in addition to email messages. And I, I had a large list, but I thought I would try like 100 to start with. So I sent it out to 100 of my best friends, and like five of them said, take me off this list. Now these are people that, I don't know if anybody's here, but these are people that have come to our meetings lots and lots of times, but they just didn't want to be texted. Well, so I stopped doing that. And I, and I should add, so again, because you direct message, you, you sent direct messages. No, this was just a text know, over a mobile text, phone. I know, text, but you, initially you sent direct messages to over 100 Different people on thing, Facebook. Right. But it's still the same thing as a text message. So a direct message is a direct line to that person, and it is intrusive. If that person did not request that communication when you're texting them and you're direct messaging them, it, it is, it's so personal and direct. I don't like getting mass mail messages on my text message because then other people reply, reply and you kept get, getting pinged at each and every reply and it's extremely disruptive. So please do not do that. Do not you know, mass message people via messenger on Facebook or via text message. We'll have to change our presentation, Larry. I actually, I think you shouldn't have given up. You think what? You should not have given up. This is a different conversation. Well, than I, this is different than the question I was going to ask, but you should not have given up. Well, the in marketing, message? here's how it works. First, okay. they ignore you. Then they fight you. Then they buy your product. So you hit the, you hit the then they fight you, and you miss the buy the product. Yeah, but they, un, they, un, uh, they, well, no, no, this is for the text messaging. Right. They, they said uh, stop. They, so what? Well, they not only said stop, but it takes them off the list. Yeah, so yeah. that's fine. So take them off the list. Okay. Then, well, I did. Then the well, 95 people that were left will yeah. stay on the list. That's I'm right. not on it. Why no, am I not on it? I, I wouldn't take well, them off the list. Well, your name is too far down the alphabet. No, uh, Larry's. I started with A. You, 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 can you only do 100 at a time? No, oh, I just okay. decided yeah. to do 100. I, I had a question for you. So, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> what was your question? Uh, this is totally, this is, I'm just have, getting into this conversation. What color is the bear? Is the question. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> So I created a minimal viable product a year ago. Okay. Figuring, ah, you know, if it works, it works, great. Well, it snowballed. 
Okay. And now I'm at the point where I need Infusionsoft, I need Trello, I need, and I'm trying to figure out what to learn first, and it's driving me crazy. And meanwhile, all the things that need to be done aren't getting done, plus my clients are getting less attention because I'm trying to do all this. Right. Where do I start? You start with the most important task. Identify what's most important that well, you need. Getting to a client is always the most important task, mm -hmm. right? Right. But so, what are <laughs> what are you trying to put on Trello and Infusionsoft, and what what tasks and what are you trying to accomplish with that? So, identify maybe your top five. So, if you have a hundred things that need to get done, right. identify the top five most important, and 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 tackle them. And and what I said in my presentation: try to keep it simple at first, if it's mm -hmm. possible. You know, don't get overly granular with these tasks and try to chip away at them. And once you get comfortable with Infusionsoft, with Trello, right. and doing what you need, then you expand and add more. But identify the most, because, you know, when you're overwhelmed, nothing gets done. It's exactly what's happening. Not even the simple I'm tasks. I'm stuck. I'm I mean, just it stuck, happens right. to all of us. And it's yeah. happened to right. me in the past until, you know, you have to take a step back analyze your 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 to-do list and, and and decide what is the most important and what can wait um, right. till later and, I mean, we, and get those done yeah, it was easy to do it in my head and now you know 30 40 clients paper. later put it on I, paper I, can't, I just can't do it so start like, on paper yeah. and then move to Trello and well, implement I, Trello I, I actually started using Trello three days ago okay and it was when you brought it up I was like wow I was like, I'm so, doing this. And then you saw the calendar. I'm like, I don't, I don't, how did I even get that? Larry, So my Larry, IT guy is... Let me, let me ask, has, yeah. show of hands in the room, how many, who would like to be hired by Larry to help him with his, with his <laughs> IT? No, I'm serious. Oh, no, no, you, right, right, yeah, this right? lady, okay, right. make sure you trade cards. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm make sure you for, pay her. I'm looking for a copywriter. I'm looking for a video person. I'm looking for a, 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 a somebody who knows uh, the Adobe products, actually both, 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 um, uh, Illustrator, Photoshop Illustrator. and, uh, InDesign and, and uh, Premiere Pro. Premiere Pro, okay. All right. Well, here they are. I, I can find you a copywriter. Right. I, I actually put a post on Facebook an hour ago on copywriter. I got 15 responses. Yeah. Now I also want. They also need to do my need criteria to, to know so English. Know, but, right. Is that part of the no? What? Sorry. What? Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> You, there you go. <laughs> I don't think he wants anything broken right now. But, he but, just yeah, I, and I probably now. need a consultant to get me organized, right? All right, are there any other questions on Sunday? Any other questions before we uh, adjourn for the evening? Corey, did you have a question? Or are you just reaching for the mic? Okay, well, uh, no more questions apparently, but Don, are you willing to stay for the breakout session or do you have to leave? You need to go home, okay. Uh, so Lydia and I would make ourselves available if Lydia is willing. Yep. But in the meantime, let's give our speakers a great round of applause. Thanks, guys. Uh, really, really appreciate it.